I'd like us to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, and, and I want to ask a question, and probably you would know to give the spiritual answer because of who's asking it. If you could have one thing in your life, what would it be? Just one thing. Uh, King Midas, you may recall the literature story, thought that he wanted the ability that everything he turned, or everything he touched would turn to gold. Oh, it was great for a while. He went around and began touching all sorts of things, and, and before long these things would uh, all of a sudden turn to gold, and then he picked up an apple, found out he couldn't eat it. Uh, what he thought would end up being what he ultimately wanted, it turned out that wasn't quite what he wanted. I think there are a lot of Christians today who are deceived into thinking uh, that the world has a tremendous amount to offer. Uh, we think, well, if I could just have a, a better paying job, that would solve all of my problems. All of us have been given raises. It increased our income, but most of us would attest to our expenses likewise increased. Uh, we didn't just save that much more money. It, it wasn't the solution. It was just something that enabled us to continue a lifestyle. I wonder in our own Christian life, where would the desire to be like Jesus Christ actually fall. We are short-sighted oftentimes in our goals. I was speaking with someone this, uh, before this evening's service, and uh, the individual was talking about the projects that are oftentimes there. And, and then the decision was, you know what, let me just put a focus instead. What does the Lord have me want to do today? Now, where's that focus? And oftentimes we are extremely programmed into uh, thinking what is temporal and, and what is going to be needing to be taken place this particular day so that I can get this accomplished. And if I can get this accomplished, then all of these other things will be able to fall into place. And where does the Lord fall in all of this? Now, unfortunately, he's oftentimes relegated to the end. If there's a little bit left over, we'll go ahead and give that to him. All throughout the Word of God, you find the uh, pursuit of the Christian life to be a disciplined pursuit. You find it to be a, a pursuit where there is a great desire. First Peter chapter 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. When you look in Proverbs chapter 2, you find that the search for wisdom, if you search for as for silver, then you're going to find it. If you look for it, if you seek it as you would for hidden treasure, then you're going to find it. But there are a lot of us who probably don't look at it that way. And Paul begins to conclude this letter here, and that's what we're going to begin to focus on here this evening. We've spent a lot of time on the uh, previous exhortations. Let me remind us of uh, the entire message of the uh, entire book. Three individuals, a man by the name of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, had gone to the city of Thessalonica, and they began ministering there. As soon they found themselves facing some incredible opposition from the unsaved Jews and they were forced to flee to the nearby city of Berea, about 40 to 50 miles south of uh, the Roman road. They continued their ministry there, but eventually the unsaved Jews from Thessalonica uh, found them there. And yet again, Paul and Silas and Timothy were forced into another adjustment. This time it was Paul who was sent to Athens alone while Silas and Timothy remained in Berea for a short time. You can read about it in Acts chapter 18 that while in Athens, Paul uh, sent word to Silas and Timothy to join him immediately, though it does not appear as though they were able to actually meet together until Paul had arrived in Corinth. Paul was greatly burdened over his sudden and unexpected departure. It appears from what we're able to glean in this book that certain individuals accuse Paul wrongly of abandoning these new believers. Paul questions began to abound in his own mind regarding the welfare of these believers and even the church in Thessalonica. And so he determined to send Timothy and Silas back to them to give him a report of how they were doing. And the report that they sent back was one that provided great encouragement uh, to Paul. Not only did the ministry continue to exist after his departure, but the ministry was even thriving in the midst of some tremendous challenges. 
After hearing the good report, Paul immediately sat down and began to pen this letter that we know as 1 Thessalonians to these believers. In chapter 1, you may recall, Paul expressed his thankfulness for the genuineness of their salvation, the effect that their faith had had throughout the entire world. In chapter 2, he reminded them of the persecution that they encountered uh, upon ministering in Thessalonica and explained the manner in which they ministered to them and reminded them of the mutual suffering that they had both experienced at the hands of the Jews. Seems as though some criticized Paul for his sudden departure, but Paul explained the necessity of it in chapter 3 and the measures that he took to ensure their spiritual well-being by sending Timothy back to Thessalonica. He explained in chapter 4 how they were to function as believers and what, what happens to believers who died physically. The implications of Christ's return are explained in the first portion of chapter 5, which is then followed by a variety of commands that have been our focus here uh, for the last several weeks. His focus ultimately is that they live their lives in such a way as to be faithful unto the end. And he brings all of this to a conclusion in chapter 5, verses 23 through 28. Let's begin by noticing, first of all, the desire of Paul. As Paul concludes his letter to these believers, he concludes with a style that would be typical of the culture in his day, but he takes and kind of twists it, so to speak, and adds the various elements of a Christian greeting so that it would be much more relevant to these believers. And in closing this letter, he desires that these uh, believers, he, he lists two desires that would really be a very fitting conclusion to this letter, and then gives some exhortations that follows a closing entreaty. Let's begin the reading in verse 23 where the Bible says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I want you to notice, first of all, the object of his desire. Paul explains in verse 23, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Who is he looking to to fulfill all of this? Well, he describes him as the God of peace. It could be a phrase that suggests either the God who gives peace or the God who is characterized by peace. When I look at the entire message of 1 Thessalonians, it seems that these believers were experiencing tremendous difficulty and tremendous opposition. Paul already explained in chapter 2 and verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. He acknowledged in chapter 1 and verse 6 that they received the word in much affliction. In the midst of tremendous persecution, how encouraging it is to know that we serve the God of peace, the God who is capable of giving peace, the God who is peace. The Bible describes uh, two different types of peace. The peace with God is that which is obtained in salvation the very moment that one places his trust in Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. No longer is this individual an enemy of God. He is instead one who enjoys great peace with God. Nothing can ever change that relationship. It is a relationship that is sealed for all of eternity. The peace of God is described in Philippians chapter 4 and is that, that which is uh, the lot of a believer who is in a right relationship with God. You may recall verse 6 where it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by uh, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace that God gives will garrison your hearts and your minds. It's going to form a defense around it. This is the type of peace that is contingent upon a right relationship with God. But it is also the type of peace that can be lost. One of the 
most miserable people in all this world is a Christian who is backslidden. He knows better, yet he's chosen to disregard whatever God has instructed, and he truly feels it in his relationship. But I want you to understand as believers that we can enjoy the peace of God even in the midst of tremendous adversity. You know, peace is not something that is simply achieved in times of ease. Peace can be obtained and peace can be experienced in some of the most unbelievably difficult situations. In the context of Peter, to, or in the context rather of 1 Thessalonians to me, the, best, the better interpretation is that it is the God who gives peace, which would be no doubt a welcome sight for all of these believers. Grammatically, it could equally be the God who is characterized by peace, but regardless, that's the one to whom Paul is praying. There's the object of his desire. What's the nature of his desire? What does he want? He says that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are two wishes, in essence, that Paul is going to express in verse 23. And the first one is that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Let's say it this way, a complete holiness of life. The word sanctify is used frequently throughout the word of God. It means to consecrate something or to dedicate it, uh, literally to include in the inner circle of something that is holy. Paul's desire for these believers is ultimately that God would make them holy. And then he uses the word holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. It's only used here in the New Testament and it suggests being totally complete. In other words, in every way complete, that, that you would be quite perfect, says Paul. A high standard. Paul's desire was that God ultimately would make them holy in every single area of their lives. Entirely. Obviously, a person would never reach this status, this side of eternity. Yet we should still strive to be that kind of holy. Amen. We may not see it in reality, but it ought to be our goal. It ought to be our pursuit. It ought to be that which characterizes our lives every day. But I also find that this concept where he says that I, I pray that uh, the God of peace would sanctify you wholly. And the word sanctify, the, the mood of it suggests that this is a wish that Paul has, a desire that Paul has. I want God to, to sanctify you entirely, every aspect of you. What this does is it re eliminates the compartmentalization of our lives. I'm amazed at how all of us, and myself included, tend to compartmentalize things in our own lives. For some, maybe it's the way that we're organized. For some, it uh, might just be what we end up doing. But we tend to look at life in certain segments. There's work, and there's church, and there's uh, my hobbies, and there's uh, whatever else we might throw into there. But there are three rather broad categories. Satan has successfully deceived us, I believe, into isolating certain components of our lives. And here's what ends up happening. We have a tendency to justify known sin in some areas by pointing to the good deeds in other areas. You ever been guilty of that? I'll close my eyes and not look. <laughs> we all have, right? Well, I know, Lord, that this is wrong over here, but look at all the good that I'm doing over here. In doing that, what we're actually doing is trying to balance the known bad with the good. The person who's compartmentalized his life into all of these different segments will say, well, you know what? Uh, it's okay. God knows I'm not perfect. Now, let me say this. God does know you're not perfect. <laughs> He's well aware of that. But it's not okay. Okay. We can't just excuse it and say that uh, this, I'm able to justify wrongdoing. Now, some of you are thinking perhaps, well, theologically, we are perfect in God's sight, but you're not in your practice. It doesn't take long for you to figure that out. 
God, real, we, we can't justify wrong in this area by pointing to this area. Wrong in one area is never justifiable by pointing to the right in other areas. What's Paul's desire? Paul's desire is that God would make them holy in every area of their life. Does that describe your desire for you? Do we have that kind of a passion for God? Do we have that kind of a desire to be like Him, that we're willing to do whatever it takes just to simply be like Him? To go through whatever we need to go through just so that we can be drawn closer to Him? Most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, will say, well, I'm willing to go to a certain extent. But I don't know that I want it that badly. Complete holiness of life. And secondly, his second request is, and I've just phrased it this way, complete holiness of person. And he says, and continuing in verse 23, And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you notice, I pray, God, are in italics, suggesting this has been supplied by the translator so that it aids our understanding in the English language. Paul says, I want your whole spirit and soul and body to be preserved blameless. Man is tripartite, means we're made up of three parts. There's the body, the soul, and the spirit. God created, according to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, man in his own image. Part of that entails this idea that man is composed or made up of three different components. And Paul's desire is, I want your entire person to be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses the word spirit, first of all. We're describing the rational part of man that is capable of perceiving and receiving spiritual things. This is that part of man which God the Holy Spirit exerts its influence. Martin Luther said it's the highest and noblest part of man. This is that part of man that communicates with God. Enables us to receive spiritual things. Just as the spirit is immaterial, the soul is also immaterial. They're incapable of being seen. The soul is the seed and the center of the human life. It's that part of man that makes him conscious of himself. It's the seed of his personality. It contains his emotions. It contains his desires. Your spirit enables you to communicate with God. Your soul enables you to communicate with man. It's that aspect about you, by you that, that thinks and feels and wills. And then Paul says the body, the only material part of all that he described, obviously houses both the spirit and the soul, the physical part through which the inner person expresses himself. Uh, kind of unique how we think of people. Uh, we think of them in terms typically of the body. Uh, you hear a person's name and an image comes to your mind. Okay? Uh, really what defines that person is his inner part. Okay? Uh, not as much the outer part, but nonetheless, that's how we typically think of it. Paul's wish is that this entire person, the body, the soul, and the spirit, be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word preserved suggests uh, to uh, reserve, to cause a state, condition, or an activity to continue. We want to uh, reserve it, keep it unharmed and undisturbed. Paul says, I want this entire person to be kept blameless or blamelessly. Almost sounds as though it's until the time when Christ comes, but the word until is actually in. I'd say in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ comes, Paul's desire is, and most likely direct reference back to the rapture, Paul's prayer is that these believers would be preserved in these bodies. Uh, probably he's anticipating that they would actually live until the rapture. They didn't. But think how much closer you are. I had the opportunity of performing uh, Jerry's funeral uh, this past weekend and thought to myself, in fact, I mentioned it as well, wouldn't it be something if while a preacher was doing a graveside service, the rapture took place? 
It'd be a pretty neat place to be alive, that's for sure. Uh, let's see, I don't know how quickly it takes place and how much you'd be able to see, but uh, man, wouldn't that be something if all of a sudden that body was gone? Uh, be even more something to see who was still standing there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, quite a thought, but Paul's prayer is this. I want you to be holy in every area of your life. And I want you to be holy in every aspect of who you are. Everything that defines you, various areas of your life, the various capacities of who you are, is it going to be achieved this side of eternity? No, but it ought to be our desire. Peter described it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1 as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, every area, every compartment of your life. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. I wonder if we really understand the essence of what Peter is saying. Every area of your life, be holy. I don't know about you, but I got a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do in a lot of areas. But let's not just excuse it that way. Let's take and start working, making progress in that area. Let's determine that we're not just going to excuse it away and say, well, yeah, psh, I'm a mess. We don't have to keep being a mess. Stop being a mess and, and start living the life that God would have you to live. We see the desire of Paul. We also see the confidence of Paul. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. This is the basis for Paul's request. The basis is based, first of all, on the, the nature of God. What does the Bible say? God is faithful. Faithful is he that calleth you. God is faithful. God is someone who is trustworthy. God is one who is completely dependable, you can place your full confidence in God and never be disappointed. Never. He's the only one in whom we can place that kind of confidence. Our spouses will let us down. Our bank accounts will let us down. Our jobs will let us down. The most secure thing that we think on this earth will inevitably let us down, but God will not. I shared the other day, and I don't know, maybe it'll develop it into a message one day, but some of the foundational things of life. How do we go through difficulties in life? Uh, there are, I think what I've described as kind of some foundational principles. God's way is always right. It's always perfect. His timing is always best. His work is always good. And here's a fourth one that I added to that today. His nature is always faithful. You can rely on God all the time. Listen to just some of the scripture passages that would relate to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Hebrews 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. It didn't make sense to her, but what she did know was God was faithful. Was Sarah perfect in it? No. Read the account in Genesis. But she reached the point where she determined, you know what? God said this, therefore I can completely rely on it. 1 Peter chapter 4, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, he's faithful, aren't you thankful? And just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
The same word is used of the Lord who is also faithful. The Lord is faithful according to 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 3, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Understand and be, allow your life to be governed by this reality that God is always faithful, regardless of what we perceive to be true. It's easy to rejoice in the prayer requests when God answers them in a positive way and rejoice in his faithfulness. But what if God takes that same request and does not answer it in a way that we might think is positive? Is God still faithful at that point in time? Yeah. Is he going to seem that way? May not. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a reality. And you're going to have to look at life and you're going to have to interpret things. And all of the challenges that you face and the things you don't understand, in all of that, God, you are still faithful. You are still one on whom I can absolutely depend. And sometimes that's all we've got. But let me ask you, what more do you need? See? Well, I need that plus understanding. Well, it doesn't work that way. I need that plus so-and-so. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Faithful is he that calleth you. There's the nature of God. Paul's confidence is also based on the work of God. Paul says, the faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God is faithful, there's his nature, and God will do it. We can be assured that God will do exactly what he has said he will do. He called you to salvation, he'll finish it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God called these Thessalonian believers to salvation. He's done the same for you and he will bring to completion what he began. And we can be assured of the same for us because God knows no unfinished product. God's at work in your life and he's faithful and he is also going to do it. We see the desire of Paul and the confidence of Paul. That leads us thirdly to the instruction of Paul. There are some more random things that Paul just simply states here at the end. He says in uh, verse number 25, brethren, pray for us. <laughs> the term brethren suggests these are believers who are in Thessalonica. But what I want you to see is this. We have a relationship to each other. Pray for us, says Paul. You know, God didn't save us to be islands to ourselves. A lot of Christians think that way. Um, it's not at all what God intended. God saved you to minister. God saved you to minister to people, to be a blessing to people. I took this verse and put it on the bottom of the prayer list. Honestly, what more fitting verse could there be? <laughs> Pray for us. That's what all these people on these prayer lists want. Pray. There are people on this list that have been on there for a long time that are in need of Christ. Pray for them. There are specific individuals that I'm praying we are able to reach through this ministry. Pray. How easy it is to grow disheartened when we don't see the results that we want. We don't see the lives being transformed. Keep praying. The nature of this command is continuously pray. I want you to not give up, says Paul. I want you to pray for us. Pray for those, pray for Paul. Pray for those with whom he traveled. Pray for those to whom he ministered. Simply pray for us. We have a, a responsibility towards each other. I long to be the recipient of your prayers. I am encouraged greatly to hear I'm praying for you. Those are good things. A pastor friend of mine, I'll, I'll get a text from him every Sunday morning praying for you today. We'll go back and forth and, and different ministry opportunities that he's got. It's been a, a long time uh, for a span, I suppose. We probably were not doing it as we should. Not that we weren't praying for each other. But we weren't texting each other, uh, that aspect. But it's been going on 
for years praying for you today. Those are good things. Let's learn as believers that we're not to be islands to ourselves. Let's pray and let's earnestly do so. Don't take these prayer lists and tuck them away in your Bible where you forget about them. Uh, don't leave it on the church pew. Take it with you. That's why we do it. Second request that he makes is to greet one another. He says in verse 26, greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. This is thankfully when we can interpret the word of God culturally. Uh, this was the cultural greeting. Uh, in our cultural uh, equivalent today, we're going to shake hands, and that's the extent of it. Um, but Paul was simply saying, I want you to greet one another. And then he says to read the letter for all to hear, verse number 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. And the words I charge suggest that I give a command to someone who's under oath. Guess who the witness is? The Lord. I charge you, I, I adjure you, I implore you to do this. I'm putting you under oath with God as the witness. And I want you to read this, cause that this epistle... Be read unto all the holy brethren. Um, one of the things that may kind of blow your mind is that the culture in which the word of God was written was largely an illiterate culture. And uh, most of the people learned the word of God through what they heard. There were different people, the scribes and the, and the various uh, leaders, and they were responsible. Letters uh, were oftentimes sent by kings and so forth. They were sent by servants. And, and certain trusted individuals that they knew would be able to read that letter accurately. It's why Paul rejoiced when he was able to send a letter with a man such as Timothy or a man such as Epaphroditus. Why? Because he knew that they would read this correctly. You could hire anybody to take the letter and deliver it and read it. But there are some people you wouldn't want that to happen to. Paul says, I want this letter to be read to everyone, and I, I'm putting you almost under oath that this is what's going to take place. This letter was not intended for a certain select group of believers in Thessalonica. This was one that was intended for everyone. Paul said, I want everyone to benefit from it. And through preservation, you and I are able to benefit from it as well. And that concludes then with the final point that we'll have tonight in the final verse, and that is the prayer of Paul in verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. This grace, they were already saved individuals. Paul is not asking that God's saving grace be with them. He's asking that God's sustaining grace be with them. You know, anything that God does for you is gracious. Uh, we don't deserve anything that he does graciously for us. What we deserve is an eternity in hell. But God in his mercy and in his love provided redemption for us. Do you know, in spite of yourself, God in his mercy and in his love has given you the grace to go through what you need to go through? Do you deserve that? <laughs> No, I dare say that every one of us in here has failed God at some point. God's never once failed us. Paul was praying that God's undeserved favor, that his grace would continue to rest upon them. Marvelous book. Whole message of it is summed up as we titled the entire series, Be Faithful to the End. Paul's ministry was interrupted seemingly, cut short, but yet they were still thriving. And Paul recognized, according to uh, chapter 1 or chapter 2, chapter 2, I think, that there were things that were still lacking in their lives. And he desired to, to try to reinforce that. But he took them all the way up ahead to the rapture, the time when Jesus Christ is going to return. And he urged them to go on and live faithful lives. Let's do the same today. We don't know when the Lord may return. We know that it could be any time. We know there are no signs that have to precede the rapture. We know that um, we are 
thousands of years closer than these who wrote in the New Testament. Recognizing we are that much closer, it would seem that we should have a greater zeal for his coming than we do. It would seem that we would have a greater desire to be like him than we oftentimes do. So I go back to the question that I asked when I began the message. If you could have one thing in life, what would it be? I hope we would all be able to say, having already been saved, that if I could have one thing in life, it would be to be like Jesus Christ. That's the passion that ought to govern our lives. That's the pursuit that ought to characterize who we are. But boy, have we gotten sidetracked by a lot of stuff. Let's not compartmentalize our lives. Let's strive to be holy in every area of who we are and not limit it to certain areas. And let's certainly not justify wrong over here by pointing to the right over here. Be holy in all manner of conversation as he which hath called you is holy so be ye holy. And let's finish this race that God's brought us on to with joy and finish that course well.